All right, so as I mentioned, I want to say thank you to Harry and for his good study on, on the second Corinthian letter. Uh, so uh, since we did a, a textual study, I thought it might be good for us uh, to, to do maybe more of a topical study. That's what we're going to start. Um, this will be a continuation of a series we've done in the past, uh, dealing with some hot button issues or, or, or sometimes uh, more difficult uh, things to study. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at. A, a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with somebody about, um, about the topic of, of uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and, and centering around, of course, adultery. And while I was at PTP, uh, our brother Scott Kane did a lesson on this topic, and man, it was good. And, and so I'm going to take the notes that I had taken from his class with some of my thoughts and discuss the topic of, does baptism wash away adultery? Adultery. And, and this, um, this can be a, con controversial is probably not the right word, but it can be a, a heated discussion at times. And, and I don't believe it's because the text is unclear. I think it's because of the emotions that inflame it. Um, and so I, I think in this, we, we need to do two things. Number one, we need to just logically and reasonably look at what the text actually says with an understanding that this is an emotional topic. Um, it, uh, it brings up things that people deal with that uh, make life tough at times and, and, um, and that Satan uses to hinder our, our growth and, and our... Uh, faith in Christ. So uh, I want to deal with this and, and, and do it with, uh, with that kind of mindset of an understanding uh, yet reasonable uh, approach to Scripture. So we're going to deal with this and I want to deal with some other issues along the way. I don't know whether this will take us one or two or three studies to get through it, uh, but we're going we're to march through it. So does baptism wash away adultery. Um, in discussing this, this topic, uh, I think there are a few things we need to lay down the groundwork for before we can approach an actual answer, because the answer is actually kind of complex. Um, it, um, not that it's hard to understand, but it's just there's different facets to, to this discussion. So, uh, breaking down the question, though, I think it's it's needful, and this is something Scott did, and I thought it was a really good, good approach, was we need to understand a few things uh, biblically. And the first idea or concept is we need to understand baptism. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding of baptism. Some of us may be struggling with that. Um, unfortunately, the denominational world has confused this topic. Uh, there are a lot of people who teach things that quite honestly are just not true in regard to baptism. And so we need to know what, what, what the Bible actually has to say about um, this idea of baptism. So what do we need to understand? Well, number one, we need to let baptism be biblical. We need to be biblical. If you go to Acts chapter 2, this is where we'll start. Acts chapter 2. You remember in the text there, what's going on is Peter and the other disciples have received the, um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The text earlier tells us that they then stand up amongst the people and they begin to preach um, this gospel sermon. And what we have are the words of Peter. Um, and so Peter then delivers this very powerful, convicting message. How do we know it's powerful and convicting? Go down to verse 36. What does verse 36 tell us? Okay, before that though, what does verse 36 say? You're right. Oh, when they heard the sermon. Yeah, what's the last line that we have there of the sermon before they interrupt it? That I just made. This what? Jesus, Lord and Christ. This Jesus what? Whom you have crucified. Whom you have crucified. Right? That's important. 
he, he's very direct with them. He says, this Jesus that I've been talking about, God has made him both Lord, right, um, and Christ. Uh, he is both God and man. He is the Savior, the anointed one of God, whom you crucified. And so who bears the guilt of his crucifixion? They did, and so do we. Um, our sin, their sin, put him on the cross. So that's, that's, that's the point at which uh, they cry out, what, in verse 37? This is what uh, Mary was alluding to. What's that? What shall we do? And the text says they were cut or pricked to the heart, right? They, they felt an immense pain of guilt. And that guilt overwhelmed them to the point they said, what shall we do? In other words, what can we do to be forgiven for this? We are sinners. And then we get to verse 38. So that all sets up verse 38. And what is the relief or, or what, what is the, the way in which God has provided a way of escape? Repentance and baptism. Yeah. So um, he, he says what? He says, repent and let every one of you do what? Be baptized uh, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, baptism is connected with, with what? Forgiveness. With forgiveness. And which side of forgiveness is it on? It's where? After you get baptized. I don't mean everything. Okay, baptism is, is, is before, right? right? Baptism is the gateway to salvation. Okay. This is really important. Yes. People misunderstand this. He, he connects it first with repentance, right? Repentance uh -huh. and baptism leads to where? Salvation. Salvation. Of sin. And so baptism is, is one of the necessary steps to lead to forgiveness. Now, you also note there its connection with repentance. Real quickly, when we talk about the concept of repentance, what are we talking about? Is that saying what you've done wrong? Okay, Pops. so is, is it saying what you've done wrong? Is that repentance? Change. So that's what a lot of the world teaches, right? This concept. I grew up in a Baptist church where we were, or Pentecostal and Baptist, where we were taught that repentance was um, making an altar call, right? It was coming up and saying, I'm a sinner. Is that repentance, biblically speaking? We change our mind. It's a, yes. So the word, the literal um, word in, in Greek carries the idea of, it's not a confession, but it is a change that occurs in our mind, our heart, which leads to change, right? But it is that, that initiation of a change of thought. What are we changing in our thought? What's being changed? Evil thoughts, we think. Evil thoughts? Maybe your mindset. You okay? Your mindset? Turn the other way and go the other direction. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So it's this, this, this concept of I am devoting myself no longer to self, but I'm devoting myself now to God. Right? That's, that's what's going on here in repentance. Repentance is a devotion toward God. I, I think this is important. And, and I heard somebody talking about it, and I was like, this is really important for us to point out. I think I, I, well, I know I knew this, but never really expressed it. Is repentance changing every sinful habit that I have? What now? Yes. Yes. No. It's commanding your, your heart, your spirit to do so. It's, change, it's, it's making a pledge to change. 
But when you became a Christian, did you understand every sinful activity you were behaving in? So then, should you wait until you've changed everything that's sinful before you become a Christian? That's not repentance, is it? Because after becoming a Christian, don't you continue to learn and grow and understand there are things I need to change in my life? Can you imagine if you sat down in a Bible study and covered every possible sin you commit? There's a problem with that too, isn't there? Are there new sins that develop in your life even after becoming a Christian? You can get in other sinful habits you need to stop. Absolutely. Repentance is that change of devotion and motive in our mind to serving God, no matter what. And then that will lead to change because when I'm devoting myself to God, I'm saying no matter what else is going on, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And that may mean that along the way, I learn better that certain things are not right and certain things are. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Brother, may I, I think add, that's really important. Yes, ma'am. May I add to that? Um, 22 years ago, I had this, this feeling came over me and it was so strong and I never felt that before in my whole life is that I felt godly. I felt sorry that my sin had hurt God. Mm-hmm. So, but, but remember, that's not repentance. Yes, that, sir. That's easy for people to make that jump. That's what I grew up believing because that's what I was taught was repentance was feeling sorry. Godly sorry. But that's not repentance. I know. Godly sorrow, Second Corinthians 7, to. verse 10, will lead to that's repentance. Yeah. Right? So yeah. feeling bad, because if I feel bad, even if I have godly sorrow, yet it doesn't make me change, is that repentance? No. There have been people who've done bad things that felt really bad about it and felt bad that they'd hurt God. But they didn't change their behavior. That wasn't repentance. I'm glad you felt bad. I mean, that, that, I mean I'm not glad you felt bad, but I'm glad that, that you had that motivation inside of you that what I did was wrong. I need to change. But unless I change my motivation, my drive in life, and begin to serve God, then that's not true repentance. That's right. okay. You know, it's really hard as a new Christian to, to recognize all those years that I went through because I was a Baptist too. In fact, I was a Baptist the best in the world. You name it, I tried them all. <laughs> but I mean, I, I was the same way. I just felt like, oh, well, you know, you just ask God to forgive you and go on your merry way. And I never really thought about changing my whole perspective and going in a completely different direction because it hurt to go in that direction if you want to know the truth. I mean, it was hard. It wasn't an easy thing to do. Well, and as we talk about this topic, that is a big part of it, right? Right. That And I think we lay the the groundwork now to better understand what comes later. But I think this concept of repentance and understanding what it is and what baptism is is super important. Good, good thought. Any others? So you have this connection between baptism and repentance leading to what? (coughs) To forgiveness, right? So we're on the pathway to forgiveness when we begin the process of of turning ourselves over to God, of of then being united with Christ in baptism so that our sins, Romans chapter 6, what does it tell us? In baptism, what's going on? We die to self, right? Just as Christ died on the cross, we're buried with Christ. That unity with Christ occurs in baptism. So that what happens on the other side? Raised to walk in newness of life. You might want to think about it conceptually kind of like this. In, in, In dying to self, what are we doing? We have to take off the self garment. So that as we get laid down into the water, we take on the, the Christ garment so that we can be resurrected to a new creature. It's Galatians 3.27, isn't it? For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have what? Clothe yourself in Christ. In order for the clothing to occur of Christ, what has to be taken off? The old self. We'll come back to that in a little bit. That's our next point. So, but, um, but 
let the baptism be biblical. Number one, understand conceptually where it is in the salvation plan. That it is that last step into the door of salvation. Make sense? All right. So, um, we need to understand baptism. We need to let it be biblical. We need to let it be biblical in purpose. That's what we were just talking about. Now, I know the false concept is taught throughout the Christian world that baptism is an expression of an outward, it's an outward expression of an inward peace or grace or salvation. Or that kind of concept of baptism is an outgrowth of salvation. When you look biblically, that's just not the case. Baptism is a step on the way to salvation. It's not something that comes after, but before. Go to the book of Acts, and you look at every example in the book of Acts of someone going from a sinner to a saint. In every one of those occasions, what does that person do? Baptize. Now, most people will, 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 will uh, heartily confirm that you have to believe. But do you know that belief is not mentioned in every one of those conversions? Yet I believe it's fully necessary. Repentance. Isn't repentance necessary? Yes. And, and most of the Christian world will agree with you. It's necessary. It's not mentioned in every example. Confession of Jesus. Is it necessary? You need to be willing to confess Him? Absolutely. Right? But do you know it's not in every one of those conversions? Yet what is in every one of them? Baptism. Baptism is in every one of them. Do you think God understood something? That we were going to need that? That we we're going to need that understanding? I think so. Um, its purpose is uniting us with Christ so that His blood can wash away our sins so that we can be resurrected to a new life. So let it be biblical in purpose. And then let it be biblical in mode. This is another distortion that I believe Satan has brought on the world. In mode. How is baptism to be done? Uh, there's a lot of ideals or concepts taught about it. Some teach, probably the majority teach that it should be by immersion into water, but that's not the only way, right? There's the concept of sprinkling. And pouring, where sprinkling is where they take some water and they just sprinkle it upon you. Or pouring is they take some water and pour it on your head. What's the problem with those not, modes? Not what it says in here. Okay. They say, he says to complete submersion. Okay. Yeah, so we mentioned this before, um, but the word baptism, this is where a lot of the confusion comes from, I believe. But the word comes from a Greek word, baptizo. It's a transliteration of baptizo. Baptizo literally means to dip, to immerse, or to submerge. The concept is clearly taught that baptism is an immersion or submersion into something. Um, in biblically speaking, it's an immersion into Christ. Um, the book of Colossians brings this out really well in Romans 6. But let's go to Gal uh, sorry, Galatians. That's not, <laughs> I'm combining some books there. Um, go to Colossians chapter 2. Sorry about that. Get that. That's a new book. Colossians chapter 2, um, if we go down to, let's start at verse 11, but we're going to go to 12, you're right. Um, somebody read 11 and 12, please. And you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hand by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh 
by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Right. So, so looking at that text, you notice verse 11 says you got to do what first? You got to put off before the burial. You got to put off that old man, right? You got to put off the flesh. You got to take off that fleshly garment, that selfish garment. You lay it aside so that you can be what in verse 12? Buried. Understand that concept of buried. I'm sorry, when you sprinkle or you pour, that's not a burial. A burial is going down fully immersed into whatever you're, um, you're going into. Right? So Paul uh, here paints the picture of what, real, uh, what biblical baptism is. It is the process of being buried into the water so that you can be raised up on the other side um, fully uh, clothed in Christ. There's a, um, um, another image of this in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8. At Acts 8, you have Philip being sent to the eunuch. Uh, verse 35 tells us that, uh, well, the previous verses tell us that um, the eunuch has been reading from Isaiah 53. And uh, verse 35 tells us that it was at that point Philip taught him what? Christ. He taught him the gospel. And then at one point, I think it's verse 37, the eunuch says, Look, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? What's Philip's response? If you believe, then you may. And then what does he do? What does the eunuch do? He makes the great confession of faith. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then what happens? They stop the chariot, they get out, and both go down into the water, and there he baptizes the eunuch. I'm telling you, the sprinkling and pouring were okay. What a great occasion to make use of sprinkling and pouring. They didn't need to go down into the water. That could have been taken care of very easily. Uh, but we just have the image of what biblical baptism is. And again, if we truly translated the word baptizo as we should then there wouldn't be this this confusion of thought I don't think so let it be biblical in mode and in purpose we've already alluded to this but in baptism let the old man of sin die let's go to Romans 6 I've alluded to this several times but let's just go back and, and reread this text Romans chapter 6 um, and verse 1. Um, someone begin at verse number 1 and read through 7, please. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in sin? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were baptized, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been unified, united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has freed from sin. Okay. Now. That's good. Right there. Thank you. Um, so you notice on that particular context, it's bookend at the beginning and the end on what concept? If you look at verse 1, verses 6 and 7, what is it? Baptism. Mm. Now that's the heart that's in the middle, right? But what's the two bookends? Repentance. Repentance, right? The concept of let the old man die. Yeah. 
Let the old man die, putting off the sinful garments, laying them aside, and being buried with Christ. All right, he says in verse number 1, Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now notice who's he speaking to. Christians. Christians living in Rome. And he says, Christians, you need to do what? Let the old man die. Or you're not, in other words, he's saying, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. What's another way to put that? No, we're not to continue in sin, right? We're not to live in sin. Um, in Christ, we've been set free of that old way of life. Now, I thought Christians had it all together and weren't sinners. We are not in Christ. We, so we never sin. Well, we don't. We don't have to, brother. We don't. But but get my concept. Okay. Don't don't jump ahead of me. <laughs> but even as Christians, we understand there are times when you and I may get involved in sinful activities. Yes. So what's Paul's point? Let the old man of sin die. So even along the way, there are times when you and I are going to have to stop sinning. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to put that stop to it. And so that tells us that, you know, Christians struggle with this, but we've got to let the old man of sin die. And so that's a continual process that we are working through this. Um, and that also may mean that when I became a Christian, there may, have been a, there may have been some things in my life that weren't the way they should, and I need to make change as soon as I know about those things. I need to try to work to make change in my life. All right, so let the old man of sin die. And, um, so Brother, may I ask a question, make a comment? So you don't become comfortable with that sin once you realize that it is a sin. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back to that and talk about it a little bit more as we move forward. But yes, uh, it's a danger for any of us to get comfortable with sin. Yeah. Um, but Satan will try to do that to us, right? Mm -hmm. The next thing in thinking about understanding baptism and kind of following along what we're talking about is we need to be willing to, and this goes back to what we're just saying about repentance and, and overcoming sin, we need to be willing to die daily. Willing to die daily. There's a well-known verse in Luke 9:23. But most of us could quote at least a portion of it. Luke 9:23. What does Jesus say to his followers? He said to all, and if anyone would do what? Follow me. If you would come after me, what? Take the cross and do what? And, die, and deny, deny yourself. Don't leave that part out. That's really important there. What's the carrying your cross? That's what it is. Carrying your cross is doing what? Denying self. Denying our lust and our desires that go in contrary direction to that of Jesus. Whatever that may be, I need to be willing to crucify those desires, to put them to death. Each day I wake up. This is the battle of Christianity. Romans chapter 7, what does Paul say about himself? In the end of Romans 7, Oh, wretched man that I am. Why is he calling himself a wretched man? He was struggling with He's struggling with this concept of dying daily. But that is what you and I are called to. Uh, in Galatians 2 and verse 20. This is a, a popular text as well. I remember learning it as a song uh, at, uh, at camp. What does Paul say here? He says, I have Christ. Yet not I who live, there is no longer I who live, yet, uh, but it is Christ who lives in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right, and so, uh, as a Christian, that is our motive, right? That, that, that's our motto. I live for Christ. I'm trying to represent him in every area of my life. I want him to, um, to just, uh, his light to glow out from me. We're all what? Reflections of the greater light. And we're to be reflecting his light in our life. We must be willing to die daily. Um, and along the way, kind of alluding to this thought, uh, um, we go to 1 John chapter 1. This is uh, the kind of concept uh, that John brings out in his writing about walking in light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 John 1 and 5, the text says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. Now when, God, when the text says God is light, what's, what's, uh, what's he trying to illustrate for us? What does it mean, God is light? Does it just mean God's a bright light that shines out? What? Pure. Purity, right? Of His holiness, of His sinlessness, of His perfection, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the ideas that are, trying, that are being brought out when it says God is light. It's all the things that make God holy. Right? God is light. And so every action that God performs is what? Holy, holy, pure. Yes, pure, righteous, holy, righteous, perfect, perfect, sinless. Uh, God cannot sin, neither can he be tempted by sin, James tells us. God is light and in him is no darkness, no sinfulness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, what's another way to say that? While we walk in sin. sin. Notice that, walk in sin. That's an important concept here. Walk in sin. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, notice again, walk in light, <coughs> As He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. Notice it's conditional, isn't it? If, if then, what's the condition? Walking in the light. That cleansing that comes from His blood is conditional on what? On our behavior, our walking in the light. I'm going to come back to that walking in a minute. So, um, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's interesting. All right. So, what is he talking about here? I thought he just said that in order for his blood to cleanse us, we have to walk in the light. But then he says if we have no sin, his, um, the truth is not in us. We're deceiving ourselves. Well, what in the world is he alluding to? Is, is, is John, is the Holy Spirit contradicting himself? No. Can't be really it right. Okay, explain to me how he's not a contradiction. That if you are, if you're trying to walk through life and you're telling yourself that you don't sin, that you're perfect or whatever, then you're deceiving yourself and him. Okay, so how can you walk in the light and still sin? I agree with you, but... Is that daily thing? Unwilling. 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 What's the word? Not willfully. Okay, not willfully. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? Dying daily. Dying daily. Repentance. Okay. All right, it's important for us to understand the two different concepts of walking and sinning. Continuous walking in is continuous and doing it. Yes, continuous. It it is an ongoing activity versus a one-time activity. 
Like can you, I sin in a way in which I, I sin, but it's it's it's, just, it's contained to one moment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I also sin and it's contained to a lifestyle? Yes. Yeah. There's very different concepts there, isn't there? There's one of living in sin and the one-time sin that I commit. Now, you think about, um, let's say I, I stub my toe and, and, I, and, I, and I use the Lord's name in vain. Right? That's sinful, isn't it? Yes. All right? Is that different than um, lying every day, <laughs> or saying it every day, becoming a patterned liar, right? Yeah. Is are both of those sinful? Yes. yes. Can both of them lead you to hell? Yes. yes. If you don't Very true, right? Both of them are sinful. Yet, are both of them the same in action? No. 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 What's the difference? Lifestyle. Lifestyle, okay. No, so, habitual. yes, it's not habitual. One is contained to a moment in time. The other one is an ongoing thing that needs to be changed. Now, as Christians, no matter whether we've committed, let's just say, for instance, we've only ever committed one time acts, if outside of Christ, we're still going to go to hell for that, right? And so we just need to get this concept of sin, not all sin is, is the same in nature. Now, both all will lead to the same place if it's left undealt with. But there is a difference between the sin I live in and the sin that I, that I sometimes commit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the condition in verse number seven that will keep the blood of Christ from cleansing us? Is it the one-time sin we commit or is it a lifestyle of sin? Lifestyle. The habitual sin, right? Is the one that is conditioned in verse seven. Now, the Greek language really kind of brings these concepts out, but we're not gonna go through a Greek class. But I think just looking at the text itself, explains what he's referring to here. So, as Christians, do I sometimes still commit sin? Yes. Yes. He says if we say we never commit sin, we're lying to ourselves. We're, we're being deceitful. And henceforth, we're sinning again. <laughs> right? We're sinning on our sin. So even as Christians, I, we commit sin. All right? Now, I agree, we don't have to, yeah. and we can. We, we better get better at it as we get older and as we learn more. Um, but I think his point here is understanding the difference between the two types of sin and, and also understanding that none of us are high and mighty. All of us need what? God's forgiveness. The key is walking in the light, not allowing sin to become habitual. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting parallel. When you go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, we go there to talk about uh, why you should attend and participate with the church, which is very true. But I want you to notice the text there. Not what? Verse 25. Not Forsaking the assembling of the saints. Not forsaking. Is that a one-time sin or is that habitual? That's habitual, isn't it? Because he's talking about it's an ongoing problem as, as is the what? The manner or the habit of some. You better get active with the church or you're in trouble, Right? Because what does he say in the next, in the very corresponding verses? If we continue in that kind of sin, what? There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins for you. Habitual sin is the conditional sin talked about in 1 John chapter 1. All right. Um, so, we look at this concept. There's more there. You can go on into chapter 2. I just don't have time for it. 
next week, as we look at this question of, does baptism wash away the sin of adultery? Uh, first, we look at the need, our need, to understand baptism. Next week, we're going to look at our need to understand marriage biblically. And we'll spend some time looking at that. And so we'll look forward to that next week. I'm out of time for this study. And so we'll dig in deeper in that. Thank you again so much. We'll be dismissed and rejoined for our worship in just a few minutes.